Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe Devader. And I'm Peter Spezia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Up first to speak for our two games is 2019's Fire Emblem Three Houses. The strategy RPG series is returned to home console after 12 years with a season-inspired branching narrative and many recruitable characters. Following that is the first expansion to one of the greatest turnabout stories in gaming history with all the pressure that came with that position, 2015's Final Fantasy XIV Heavensward. You know, it's a shame that game delays threw off the original intended theme of uh, this episode. This was supposed to be the week that the new Advance Wars remake uh, came mm -hmm. out. So we're like, yeah, pair it alongside... Fire Emblem for strategy RPG. Well, no, nope, that didn't work out. That'll be next year. Don't worry about that. That's coming. Uh, so, unfortunately, the theme, I guess, this week is fantasy warfare. It's, it's the best we could do. Although, you may hear in the, uh, the critical tracks here that operatic vocals also come into play. And that's just about the fare you'd expect for Final Fantasy and Fire Emblem. And even then, like some of the tracks in the Final Fantasy side, as people are going to see, not exactly what you'd expect from a Final Fantasy game. That is true. Yeah. Also, apologies. Our illness is starting to <laughs> pop up a little bit. Uh, you know, America is still trying to fight off a pandemic, but that doesn't mean that other sicknesses are floating around. So I'm uh, fighting through some nasal congestion after we've had like two COVID scares this month. It's been a crazy time at my household. Uh, you've got some chest throat congestion going on. Mm -hmm. It's also no fun. So we're still fighting through it, trying to get you uh, your podcast fix this week for original sound chat. Joe, that aside, how are you doing and what are you playing? I'm doing pretty all right. Since the last time we talked, I finished a bunch of games. Okay. <laughs> um, I finished Death Store. Very good game. I finished Eastward. Very good game. And I finished Pokemon uh, Brilliant Diamond. Yeah. Beat, beat Cynthia. Almost one Pokemon tanked the entirety of her team. I took out like four out of six of her Pokemon just with a Blissey. Which, turns out, you load that Blissey up with a couple Calm Mines and a couple of uh, Minimizes, that thing's untouchable. <laughs> Pretty good. So, that was that felt really good. Uh, but most recently, I have started playing uh, Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair. Hey. Would have had a review out by now, except for the fact that apparently uh, over at Nintendo World Report, I did get a code for this game. I am doing the review. Uh, they were sent to the wrong email, and we didn't find them until the 25th. Oops. And em Embargo was on the 29th. So <laughs> no, that's, that's too short of a turnaround for a Danganronpa game. That wasn't going to happen. And also, uh, it's fine, because we also get to hear Matt talk about playing the first game, because he's reviewing that one. That should be a good time. Yeah, I'm interested to see how that goes. I stopped right before the first trial. Uh, the last time I played. And I also played about an hour or so of uh, Shin Megami Tensei Five. Finally, uh, finally cracking into that. So, you know, it's been a lot of video game playing over the past couple weeks, but mostly because there were stuff I was already like halfway through when we talked last anyways. Yeah, I beat Pokemon Shining Pearl. Uh, I'm trying to think of what happened the last time we talked. And it's been a while based on how the holiday fell and how we've recorded. So, yeah, it's been a little bit. But I did beat Shining Pearl. I didn't have a single Pokemon tanking everything. But it was a, a tough fight with Cynthia there. But still beat first try. And uh, let's see. I've installed Guardians of the Galaxy to play on my Xbox Series X. So I think that's up next. We'll see what happens when the Halo Infinite campaign drops in the next few days i'm still gonna try playing it solo i know some people are like oh wait until co-op but uh, who knows at this point how long that will take so i think i'll enjoy that i'm very interested to hear how how guardians goes i have heard that in terms of soundtrack if you're playing on streamer mode 
it's weird and <laughs> surreal and awkward. But I've heard that if you if you're using the licensed tracks, they are used to fantastic effect, apparently. Mm-hmm. And I think we both also have to try to fit in uh, the Artful Escape in before the end oh, of yeah. the year. As uh, Best of 2021 is coming to a narrow focus here. Uh, for what it's worth, if you're curious about the behind-the-scenes inside baseball workings, we have a temporary top 10 for each of us, uh, and then like a handful of games that may work their way in. So we've got a couple more weeks until... We're finalizing all of that. So it's uh, not as scary as we may have made it out to be. It's like there are definite tiers of soundtracks, I think, this year. Once you start really looking at it. Well, yeah, but you also you've tweeted on the account. There are 65 games on the list in general. And that includes, to be fair, that includes like stuff that we already know. If it gets a call out in the show, it's going to be an honorable mention. Right, right. Uh, it's not going to be a full one, but like 65 games. That we feel worthy of of shouting out in some capacity. That's insane. It's a lot. And you can reach out to us at Soundchat OST on Twitter. If you feel like there's one that you think we may uh, be missing. Or you feel you want to kind of throw your two cents in on for our best of 2021. Again, that'll be wrapping up soon. So please do that shortly. All right, we actually have some composer follow-up news to run through here quickly because it's been a few weeks since we've been able to report on something in a timely manner. Uh, Let's talk about how the Game Awards are this week on Thursday, December 9th. Uh, It's been a weird build-up hype cycle to the Game Awards of uh, whether or not you recognize Activision Blizzard and its industry abuses and things like that. But let's talk about a couple of the awards that we'll, uh, I guess, pay attention to. And that is Best Score and Music. The nominees are The Artful Escape, Cyberpunk 2077, Deathloop, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, and Near Replicant. Uh, Joe, what do you make of those and who do you think will win? I'm not sure. First of all, Cyberpunk 2077 shouldn't be on there. Uh, it shouldn't be on any category, honestly. <laughs> not yet. Not until they fix it. I mean, I think it was a good soundtrack last year, but it's definitely one of those let's throw marketing budget at the awards mm-hmm. to remember a game that came out late last year. Deathloop is weird because I've heard so many people talk about how Deathloop is a fantastic game. Not a single person has mentioned the soundtrack. Granted, though, when looking into it, it is Tom Salta for some of it. And we've talked about him before for his work on uh, Red Steel. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's a familiar name. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy feels a little bit weird if it really is as reliant on licensed tracks as I've heard. And near being here is just cheating. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's just borrowing a 2010 (laughs) soundtrack and maybe sprucing up a little bit. So I don't know. That's a weird call. Like, make no mistake. The soundtrack for the original Near Replicant is one of the best soundtracks to ever be written by a video game. For sure, yeah. But that video game came out 11 years ago. (laughs) Right, right, right. So I think, yeah, for this year, they may do a weird pick with Guardians uh, when you talk about the license track and mixing in uh, Richard Jacques' score. Wouldn't be surprised to see The Artful Escape, though. That seems to be a game that's kind of built on its rock soundtrack. But where's Chicory? Right, that's an odd... (laughs) A mission, and I think it's an odd nominee list for this category overall. It's that, and uh, I'm sad that The World Ends With You is not on there, but like again, like five people played that game. So I'm not surprised at that one, but where the hell is Chicory? Come on. <laughs> and then Game of the Year, the nominees are Deathloop, It Takes Two. Uh, who knows if they meant to change that title because of Take Two interactive uh, <laughs> lawsuits. That's a weird story. Anyway... Deathloop, It Takes Two, Metroid Dread, Psychonauts 2, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, and Resident Evil Village. It's an interesting one. I think Deathloop is going to get the nod this year from the majority of critics that are uh, contributing to this. Though I'd like to see Metroid Dread. I think Metroid Dread would be my pick if I had to choose. But it's, it's an interesting year for games, right? Because it definitely feels like a 2014 kind of year Mm -hmm. in that there weren't many you know big triple a huge standouts like i mean my gosh when you had the last of us part two as a big juggernaut last year uh, you think next year with all the games that are going to be in contention next year that's crazy to think about so 2021 kind of feels like a down year in that we're transitioning to a new 
console generation. You had all of the COVID delays affecting software. It's kind of a weird year, but these are still solid games. I just think it probably is going to be Deathloop at the end of the night. Uh, I think it's either going to come down to Deathloop or I could actually see them giving it to Metroid Dread. Mm. Uh, but I think you're probably right that Deathloop is likely going to be the one that takes it, but we'll just have to see. And then, of course, Jeff Keighley always hypes up the reveals for the show because what's a video game awards show anyway than a, a marketing you know, <laughs> tool to give us more trailers and reveals for games. He talks about how new game reveals are probably in the double digits this year including one that has been worked on for two and a half years. There's also rumors uh, that a uh, you know, Bioshock game is in the works. Its uh, title may be Bioshock Isolation. There are new reports a couple days ago as of time of recording that it may be set in an Antarctican city in the 1960s. So that's interesting. I don't know if that means it's going to be shown at the Game Awards or, you know, some other time. But uh, any expectations for reveals now that we don't have a Smash Brothers character to be shown this year? Some people think we could see Breath of the Wild 2. Mm. We won't, guys. No, Nintendo's not going to show that off at the Game Awards if they can do it in their own direct. Unless they announced it and then also announced a direct right afterwards. That is actually distressingly possible. Mm. But... No, not really. I, I personally don't really plan on watching this year, uh, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on Twitter like a hawk to see, A, who wins uh, Best Soundtrack, and also if it shows up in the show. Not with the nominees this year. It, it won't. But then also, like, I don't know. I there, All the trailers, I'll be able to see them on YouTube right after they come out. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I would like to see Bioshock. I think that sounds like a really neat sort of concept for Bioshock. Uh, and I think people that think we're going to see Zelda are insane. In other news, though, let's uh, walk away from Jeff Keighley's... I thought I'd come up with a funny name for it after that, but I didn't. Keighley Fest. Yeah, Keighley Fest. There we go. Anamanaguchi, who we talked about for their work on Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, are going on tour, specifically to play the soundtrack of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game. Uh, they are going on a live tour starting in late January, and it sounds really cool. I actually haven't looked at where they're playing. They're like starting in San Francisco and Los Angeles for now, and then kind of possibly expanding from there. Okay, because I imagine, like, there's still enough hesitation of, like, uh, the thing is going to actually be that safe? Who knows? Mm -hmm. So, here's hoping. Uh, that sounds like it'd be a really fun concert to go to. Here's the neat little story. Uh, we talked about Heaven's Vault. You brought that to the show earlier this year. And it's living on in the sense that it's being novelized in a two-part book series. So, not necessarily, you know, talking about the composer and how... Uh, the music is living on, but, you know, you, you shared this with me, and I thought that's really interesting for a way for uh, this indie game IP to kind of carry on its name and concept. Yeah, I'm probably going to look into maybe buying both at some point. It's weird, because I'm not 100% certain how well it feels like Heaven's Vault would, like, translate to a book, but, hey, you know what? If they got it to work, I trust them. Inkle has some good writers working for them, so... Looking forward to seeing how that turns out. Let's talk about another award show, though, because the Grammys are coming up. And in probably the coolest, biggest surprise of the year, honestly, uh, the 8-Bit Big Band has been nominated for a Grammy for Best Arrangement Instrumental or Acapella for their take on Meta Knight's Revenge from the Super Nintendo's Kirby Superstar uh, that's, it's awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. I'm so happy for them. The 8-Bit Big Band, uh, has a very special place in the history of this show as well, because it was the second remix I ever brought to the show for their take on Lonely Rolling Star from Kanemaru Damashi. And I believe we've had them a couple more times than that. Yeah. But yeah, very, very cool. What a, what a cool nomination. Always neat when video games in some form or capacity gets the nod and we'll have to keep an eye on if they win. And finally, 
uh, as far as when games get cycled in and out of Xbox Game Pass, Stardew Valley is arriving on Xbox Game Pass, and it's out now! So go check it out if uh, that is something that interests you with Eric Concerned Ape Barone, not only directing and programming and creative directing that game, but also composing its music. Yeah, and uh, if you like a chill-out game or you just need a chill-out game, hey, Stardew Valley is a pretty good one. All right, but let's get to talking about the first of our two fantasy warfare games this week, the first of which is Fire Emblem Three Houses. Finally bringing this to the show. It's actually the first Fire Emblem game that we've discussed since Fire Emblem Awakening, all the way back in episode 26. Wow, oh, Jesus. And this it is. is our sesquicentennial episode. <laughs> We're at 150, baby. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, also, we brought up Fire Emblem Three Houses before because it was number six on our Best of 2019 Countdown episode. So we've brought some of these songs to the show before, uh, but time to talk a little bit more in depth about this game. And Fire Emblem Three Houses was released on July 26th, 2019 worldwide on Nintendo Switch. The first time, I believe, in the franchise that it was released worldwide on a platform. It was the first home console release for the Fire Emblem series in 12 years since 2007's Radiant Dawn on Wii. The game is developed by Intelligent Systems and the Koshibusawa team that's inside Koei Tecmo, and it's published by Nintendo. So, Fire Emblem Three Houses, well, it's based on a strategy RPG series that focuses on turn-based tactical movement of characters around a tile-set battlefield. I think we brought up the comparison in the Awakening episodes, but, you know, basically think of this as chess on steroids, but you have experience points, levels, skills, and weapon stats. Now, the Fire Emblem series used to have a rock-paper-scissors weapon triangle that had been established previously, but that has gone away for this game instead of relying on weapon stats. And I think some of the weapons triangle bit kind of carries over in some of the skills, if I read correctly. But yeah, it's not as dominating as it was in previous Fire Emblem games. Now, the series is also famous for having permadeath, but the ability to disable this carries over from Fire Emblem Awakening, and it's used as a way to be more inviting to newer players. New to Three Houses, though, is that your character, which can be male or female, is a professor at a school with students that make up one of three houses, Black Eagles, Blue Lions, or Golden Deer. So think of like Harry Potter, but three houses, and these are soldiers. Yeah, that's, that's fair, right? So the question is, which one will you choose to ally with and teach? And because your choice then determines the outcome of the game's narrative. So it encourages replayability. Which house do you side with? What choices do you make? Who do you recruit? So on and so on. In between battle missions, at least at the beginning of the game, the player has a set number of days marked on a calendar, which can be used for a variety of activities from teaching classes and field exercises to planting seeds in the greenhouse and fishing in the pond. You can also interact with characters and build relationships that way. How do you distill the plot of Fire Emblem Three Houses? Well, let's try. The story takes place on the continent of Fodlan, and the landmass is divided into three rival nations who are currently now at peace. The Adrestian Empire to the south and west, the Holy Kingdom of Fergus to the north, and the Leicester Alliance to the east. Now, the Church of Seros, based at Garig Mach Monastery, is at the continent's center, and it's the region's dominant religion, and it's an influential power in Fodland in its own right. Now, one night, Byleth and their father, Geralt, rescue three young nobles, Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude, from bandits, greatly impressing them. During the attack, Byleth is saved by the mysterious Sothis, a strange and amnesiac girl who is inside Byleth's head, and she teaches them how to rewind time 
and she remains with them for advice. Now, Byleth is presented the opportunity to teach at Garigmach Monastery and lead one of the three houses, which is comprised of students from the Empire, being the Black Eagles, the Kingdom, the Blue Lions, or the Alliance, the Golden Deer. Soon, it's discovered that there is a conspiracy against the church when Byleth thwarts an attempt to steal the church's most valuable heroes' relic, the Sword of the Creator. Mysteriously, the sword awakens when Byleth holds it, and the Archbishop Rhea allows them to keep it. But Fodlan is on the brink of war. So the questions are, where do Byleth's allegiances lie? Who is Sothis, and why can Byleth communicate with her? And what will happen to the students of the three houses of Garigmach Monastery? Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Fire Emblem Three Houses? I played it back when it came out. It's really, really good. I've only done one route. Uh, because <laughs> going through multiple routes in that game is a lot. Like, you have to replay the first half of the game four times if you want to get all four I guess three times. Because you can actually get, like, Silver Snow, which is the church route, and I don't remember what the Black Eagle's name is. Crimson but Flower? Crimson Flower, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, you can get those two on the same path, essentially, but uh, I haven't done Golden Deer, because I've mainly been told that Golden Deer and Silver Snow are the same story. Just swapping out different characters. <laughs> uh, and then I have heard that Crimson Flower is very good, and I've heard that Blue Lions is really good. Azure Moon, I believe is what it's called. I've been told that that is a really, really good story to, to follow. So one day I'll go back and, and play more. I mean, eventually I'm going to have to. Byleth's in Smash. Uh, that's mm -hmm. out of my hands. But who knows if I'm going to go back before that. I don't know. Maybe the final game for Smash to Pieces then, as your uh, intro to the show dictates? Yep, 100% actually now dead set as the final episode of the show, unless another Smash game comes out before we get there, which is not impossible, but also our intro does say specifically the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate roster. So mm, Fair, mm. fair. So then to be clear, which one did you play? Did you do Silver Snow? Yes, I did Silver Snow because I did not realize that uh, at a certain point, when you you can only get the silver snow if you do the black eagles, right? Uh, and at one point, you have to talk to Edelgard and accept her offer to travel to the capital of the Empire with her for a bit. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're forced onto silver snow. And I hmm. did not know that, so my plan had been to do Crimson Flower first, and then that didn't happen. <laughs> so. Uh -huh. yeah. So Fire Emblem Three Houses has been a game that like I've wanted to start. I, I liked Awakening, but that was the last Fire Emblem game I played. And it's just always a daunting task. Like there's always seemingly other games I would much rather play, but it's sitting in my Switch library, that that card right there. Which is an interesting story because the first time I tried to order it, uh, I did from Amazon and I ended up getting the PAL version of the game, yeah. even though I ordered <laughs> the NTSC version. Like, I'm not, <laughs> not stupid enough to be like, oh, let's order the PAL version in the United States and get that. No, it was just a mess up on Amazon's end. So I had to send it back and then get the correct version. That was a weird Amazon package to open and be like, uh, this is not how the box looks. Why is why is there a Peggy rating on this box? Exactly. Yes, that was the biggest uh <laughs> Tell for sure. So yeah, it's it's been a game that I just have not played yet. It's a daunting one to look at, but it's also one where you pick up a lot uh, just being on the internet, especially a, a Nintendo fan centric internet. Uh, there's there's not a lot that has been kept secret. I think about this game, uh, a lot of memes with different characters and things like that. So um, I feel like I'd still enjoy it if I played it, but it's just a matter of getting to do so. And it was always been the hope that like, uh, I'd, I'd start to play it before I eventually covered it for the show. Nope. Sorry. Didn't happen, but here we are. And it's, uh, this is a game that I wanted to bring earlier in the show's life, but it's one that got pushed back a couple times. I think I have, you want to say like when, 
we were going to do uh, her story. I think as far as back as that episode, that was originally supposed to be Fire Emblem Three Houses. I remember exactly which two were uh, the ones that it got moved off of. Uh, her story is one of them, yes. But the other one was when we did Monster Prom and Persona 4. Oh, that was right. supposed to be Persona 4 and Fire Emblem Three Houses. Because I was graduating and we were going to do games with school. That's right. That's right. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, glad that we are finally talking about this game. Although... Uh, I'm going to hope that you have some experience that you've at least played a route as opposed to me who has not started the game at all. But here (laughs) I am talking about Fire Emblem Three Houses. And we talk about its development when it comes to the game with Awakenings Unexpected Success. Fire Emblem was a franchise that was on the brink of death and now it's alive. So concept development for Three Houses apparently actually began in 2015 following the completion of Fire Emblem Fates for 3DS, or as it would be known in Japan, Fire Emblem If. But the team originally planned for Three Houses to be another 3DS title. And this was scrapped when production pivoted to Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valencia, which was the remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden, which is the second in the series, I want to say, if I'm, that sounds about right. So they focused on that Fire Emblem Echoes to be like a, a remake spin-off side series. And so Three Houses would be put briefly on hold. And then the team learned of the Nintendo Switch, and they decided to make the game for home consoles, which would be a big venture because... The Fire Emblem series had not been in HD ever. So the team wanted to make it the biggest and the best in the series, and they felt like they couldn't do it alone. So with that in mind, they decided to bring in the help of Koei Tecmo, who Intelligent Systems was collaborating with at the time for the spinoff game Fire Emblem Warriors, the Musou game. And so full production began again in 2017 after Shadows of Valencia's launch. So the game has a subtitle in Japan of Fukatsugetsu, and this is a Yoji Jukugo, which is, I guess the best way to translate it is a four character idiomatic compound phrase. You're taking parts of four words, slamming it together and making it a more representative concept. So in this case, Fukatsugetsu is one of these sort of phrases for the four seasons. And that's a way that it represents the narrative's four branching paths. As it would be translated awkwardly, maybe four seasons, uh, if anything, overall it was replaced with the subtitle Three Houses in English, which makes sense based on what you're doing in the story and who you're interacting with, but it does have an overall theme of the four seasons. And so the 1996 entry in the Fire Emblem franchise, Genealogy of the Holy War, inspired the narrative of these characters who were friends in their youth coming into conflict during their older years. The Chinese novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms was also an inspiration, as was Koei Tecmo's adaptation of this in the Dynasty Warriors games. So a Fire Emblem game for Switch was first teased just saying that It's going to be a thing during a January 2017 Nintendo Direct, and this was before the Switch even launched, with a planned 2018 release window. If the timeline kind of lines up, this was even before they started development again on uh, the game. So they kind of knew that they wanted to do it, but things hadn't picked back up just yet. But then when the game was revealed fully with its official title at E3 2018, it was confirmed that the game would slip into early 2019. A Nintendo Direct in February 2019 confirmed a second delay, with the release date of July 26th, with more than to be shown at E3 2019. When the game launched, it reviewed very well, with a Metacritic average of 89. Critics praised the integration of the school system and the battalion mechanics, its narrative, the characters, the soundtrack, and the replay value. But... 
there were some criticisms that were directed at the game's easier difficulty compared to past installments. Again, you're trying to hit a wider audience on the Switch, that kind of makes sense, as well as some visual and technical problems, especially at launch. As of March 2020, the game has sold 2.87 million copies worldwide, making it the single best-selling game in the Fire Emblem franchise. The series is doing well, despite its comparatively niche status among Nintendo franchises. It won Best Strategy Game and the Player's Voice Award at the Game Awards, and it won the Strategy Simulation Game of the Year at the Dice Awards. Nominated for a few other things here and there, but those were the big wins for it at the big awards. As far as the legacy of Fire Emblem Three Houses, it got some DLC, uh, like a paid DLC release in Cindered Shadows, which released in February 2020. And this uncovered the Ashen Wolves house that was in the monastery for a side story. It's like, ah, ha, ha, there was a fourth house hidden all along with some new characters to recruit. Byleth was famously or infamously a DLC character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate that rounded out the first character pack with Garrig Mach Monastery as a stage with a bunch of the, the characters showing up in the background there. And they're fun to play as, too. I like Byleth a lot in Smash. Yeah, brings in a lot of the the big weapons and you know, with fail not the bow and you got the axe and the spear and it's it's a it's a good character but yeah i don't think i've played them all that often let's talk about the composer here that we'll highlight for fire emblem three houses though and that's takeru kanazaki surprisingly no birth information for takeru kanazaki not even a blood type but found out that he started playing electone Hey, hey. That's, that's another one. Check it off. <laughs> he also learned how to play the guitar and DTM, which had to do some digging. This refers to desktop music, I guess, basically using an electronic sequencer as a kid. But yeah, referring to it as DTM. And you know, he wrote songs for the music that he learned how to make. But he did some various things as a student, such as band activities part-time jobs at video rental stores, and game planning proposals for industry, government, academia, collaboration projects. And it was these things that inspired him to work in either a sound or an entertainment field. The main instrument that he uses for composing is a guitar. He says, quote, Telecaster is used when you want a clean and clear sound. Les Paul is used when you want a distorted, heavy, and fat sound. And other acoustic guitars and classical guitars are used according to the purpose. By incorporating the raw sound of a guitar, etc., into the game, it becomes a sound with a three-dimensional effect. So he joined Intelligent Systems in 2007, and honestly, the only source we could pull some of these quotes from was his kind of interview on Intelligent Systems' website to kind of advertise for careers at the developer for work at Intelligent Systems. Here, let's talk to one of our sound people. Uh, he also works alongside fellow composer Hiroki Morishita, and they work together so much that they're commonly referred to as the Cavalier Duo, with Kanazaki being referred to as the Green Cavalier. If you're wondering, Morishita is known as the Red Cavalier. So what has Takeru Kanazaki worked on? Uh, he's done music for the WarioWare series, specifically DIY, Game and Wario, and most recently, WarioWare Get It Together. He has also worked on the Fire Emblem series with New Mystery of the Emblem, which was a 2010 DS release that was Japan only. Uh, he composed music for Fire Emblem Fates, Warriors, and Echoes Shadows of Valencia alongside Three Houses. He also worked on the Paper Mario series with Color Splash, and he did sound support on The Origami King. He was also a sound designer on Codename Steam. So yes, a, a big sound person for intelligent systems through and through. All right. Codename Steam was a game that came out at one point, huh? Yeah. Remember how I had those uh, amiibo interactions where it's like you could put in your Fire Emblem amiibo on new 3DS and bring them into the game that way? <laughs> I didn't actually remember that. <laughs> yeah. Man, what a what a game. That was a weird one for sure. So the composers that are credited on the Fire Emblem Three Houses soundtrack include Takeru Kanazaki, 
Hiroki Morishita, the, that cavalier duo there, as well as Rei Kondo. And he comes back from working on Fire Emblem Awakening, Yuka Sujioko, one of the classic Fire Emblem composers, as well as Yoshito Hirano and Masato Koda. There was a seven disc official original soundtrack that was released in February 2021. So when we were picking this game for best of 2019, and it was like a lot of like fan rips and you know, just rips from the soundtrack that way, not an official soundtrack release. Well, we'd have to wait, you know, a year and a half to get a full official release, and it's it's a big OST. And it's also important to note that when you have these tracks on there uh, that are either used for the maps where you're kind of navigating and planning out your moves on the tile-based battlefield, or you go into these battle sequences, uh, these tracks have either rain or thunder variations. And on the soundtrack, they're primarily using the rain variations for like the full track. And this is, you know, the map music where you're, you're plotting out all those moves. But then they had a whole like separate disc for some of these thunder variations. So they also exist. We'll kind of mix them up a little bit here in the Critical Five, as you'll hear. And let's get right into the five critical tracks for Fire Emblem Three Houses. We start with the main theme of the game, and this is The Edge of Dawn. Reach for my hand. This is composed by Takeru Kanazaki and performed by Buttercup. That that's all I could find on the vocal credits of the Powerpuff Girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Broke through the squeaky voice and all, and uh, churned out this banger. So the clip that we played here, this is from the Seasons of Warfare version of The Edge of Dawn. Uh, the Edge of Dawn, the normal version, has kind of like a softer version uh, but I kind of like how this kind of plays up with some of the the EDM synth you know, instruments in here and it plays in the intro movie of the game so it's like the main theme of the game and it really establishes this melodic theme very well uh, and it's carried throughout the game uh, you hear it definitely referenced in several tracks throughout the game the clip I used here uh, involves a key change at the end of the song, but I feel like it was important to include this with the the main lyrics that people remember in the chorus because in the few choruses that play, like the lyrics get mixed up pretty significantly, but I feel like this is at least the lyrical pattern that people remember uh, for the game. But yeah, it's I think it's just, it's a neat, main theme for the game, important to include because it's a main theme, but also it really is used. It's leitmotif or at least kind of echoing off of it is used throughout the soundtrack. I think I like the credits version better than this one, mm -hmm. but I mean, regardless of what version it is, yeah, uh, this is such a good song. It's such a good piece. Uh, Buttercup the vocalist does such a fantastic job. Like she belts this song out. It's great. Uh, yeah, this is, I think, the second most memorable song you'll hear in Fire Emblem Three Houses because the next track you hear three million times. <laughs> it's an important one, especially at the beginning of the game, so all the more reason to include it. So number two on the Critical Five, this is Fodlan Wins. Are you learning how to play Fire Emblem for the first time here in Three Houses and you're kind of going through the tutorials? Well, 
here is the theme that plays on the map stage for the prologue, chapter 1, 3, 4, and 5. So, a lot of when you're figuring out your early moves in the beginning chapters of the games, you're hearing this track a lot. And the clip kind of comes from the big swell into the chorus here, but I feel like at least at the beginning of the piece, like it's it's a simple and strong marching beat kind of puts in the foundation of what Fire Emblem music will be, especially in these battle chapters. And you have the driving strings for the support with the da 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 kind of getting the rhythm going, a brass melody that comes in, but as as this clip hits here in the chorus, uh, a bigger melody, a bigger overall, and it, it just really plays on the edge of dawn, actually. It's not exact, but you can definitely hear some of the parallels there. So it's not a direct leitmotif, but an eerie callback in a way. Like you're definitely hearing the similarities there. But yeah, you're right. You're hearing this piece a lot, and it's a good thing that it's a good one so early in the game. Yeah, I hope you like this song, because <laughs> it's probably the battle theme I feel like you hear more than any other battle theme in the entire game. To the point where, hey, it's in Smash. That's true. Like, they picked this one for Smash. I think the next track is also in Smash, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, The strings are actually my favorite part. You you mentioned it. The dun 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 Like, it's this sort of, like, momentum-based sort of part in the background there, but also I, I agree the the important part to clip if you're only given 30 seconds is that big swell that uh, anybody that's played this game for more than like 10 hours probably hears in their sleep at this point. <laughs> it's 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 a great, great song. You hear it a lot. So it's good that it's good. So I knew of, of this song because of yeah, its presence in Smash and because I, I think I even helped uh, with the video editing for the review for Nintendo World Report back in the day on the game. So like I was familiar with this song and using it kind of in the bed for that review, uh, but I didn't really realize exactly how close it was to the Edge of Dawn theme until I started piecing everything together. I'm like, oh, yeah, you hear a parallel. It's not exact, but it's meant to echo it, huh? Let's get to number three on the Critical Five, and this is Blue Skies and a Battle. So when you decide to move past the beginning learning piece of Fodlan Winds and you go into Blue Skies and a Battle, this is the battle theme for Chapter 7 because this is a thunder variation. And so it's not just the map piece, which is a little lighter. You have the real intensity for when you're shifting to these battle scenes and you're feeling that drum pace, not only just the intensity of the rhythm, but then you get in the middle of the clip here, this electronic bass kick in there too, and it's so cool. I feel like it just kicks it up another level beyond what you would normally expect for a Fire Emblem piece. I feel like a March orchestral feel is like kind of standard for Fire Emblem, but this one turns it up just a little bit more with that. And that's why I really like this one. Not only does it show the next step in intensity in a battle piece, but that extra little bit with the electronic kick in there. This soundtrack in general uses a surprising amount of electronic instrumentation. Like, openly electronic instrumentation. There's some, like, major villain theme during some battle in a cave or something, at least during Silver Snow, where, like, it's straight up just an electronic song. Hmm. It's weird. But uh, I think it's used to great effect in this song. I 100% I agree. It is... Absolutely fantastic. The intensity, especially that you hear in the clip, is just, ah, oh, man, it is great. I absolutely, absolutely love this song. The piece that hits me in the face the most 
And I think it was one that we actually had absent from our best of 2019, so I'm glad we get to include it here. Number four on the Critical Five is God Shattering Star. Now, don't get me wrong, God Shattering Star was, like, right on the cutting edge of making that Critical 5 for Best of 2019, but if I had my full say, it's going here, and wow. Uh, while the previous pieces had all been composed by Takeru Kanazaki, this one is composed by his Cavalier duo partner, Hiroki Morishita, and it is the map theme, so it's the rain version, of the last chapter of the Verdant Wind route and that's where you pick Claude and the Golden Deer and oh my gosh this is incredible you get that tenor operatic performance in there and it's so good I wish I could have included the beginning of the clip but it just wouldn't have given like the full scope in 30 seconds but it hits this orchestra hit and it's and it's like oh we're we're taking it seriously this piece here it's good for a final chapter here on this route if anything the thunder version when you go into the battle it loses the vocal and i think that's, that's a weird choice but if anything when you're spending more time on the map trying to plan out all of your moves uh great 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 to hear this piece i wish i knew enough about the route to know like who is supposed to be representative with singing this i think that'd be interesting to know because i have no idea but uh, it's one that just hits you in the ears and the face, and I just really wanted to include it. It's great. It's good, but it's weird for the... I, I don't know why. The solo opera singer, for some reason, makes me laugh. Not that it's not good. This song is incredible, and oh my god, that vocalist is absolutely killing it. But you don't hear this kind of song in video games <laughs> ever. Like, I can't think of anything outside of, like, a Final Fantasy game somewhere probably has one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a really good song, but it's not one of my favorites simply because, for some reason, something about that vocal track is hard for me to take super seriously. It does seemingly come out of nowhere, uh, but I think that is what makes it so interesting and worth mentioning. But we'll wrap up the Critical Five with another great piece, and this is... Apex of the World. Another thorough, long piece, so go listen to the full thing. But I feel like, again, this is the moment to highlight because it comes full circle. Once again, composed by Takeru Kanazaki. And it is the map theme for the final chapters of the Crimson Flower and Azure Moon routes. So for Edelgard and Dimitri. And look at that, it's a callback to Fodland Winds. Uh, it's more epic in scale for sure, and it kind of symbolizes the end of the journey. But it's not only like calling back to that piece, which is also a reference to the main theme of uh, The Edge of Dawn. So I feel it just comes full circle. And for a final map track, we had, you know, the Verdant Wind piece with God Shattering Star, also fitting to include this one. Just kind of, when you're talking about apex of the world, it's, it's the tippy top here and Good to include this one. This is my favorite song in the game, and it's the one that makes me think that maybe before we get there for Smash Pieces, maybe I should play one of those two roots, just so I can, you know, hear it in context. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I also really, really love that it's just this 
throwback to the song you heard four million times back in the quote-unquote carefree moments of of Three Houses, which is the school sections, essentially. Uh, I think that's just a really, really cool throwback and a great way to like revisit that. And yeah, it's it's fantastic. This is a great song. Some tracks on the cutting room floor. Joe, you have two, because you played this game. Uh, hit me with them. Well, my first one is Life at Gehrig Mach Monastery. <laughs> Now, I know what you're thinking. This doesn't seem like it's a song you'd hear in war, and you're right. This is a song you hear at school, because, again, it's probably the only song in the game that you are going to hear more than Fodlum wins, because this is the song that plays when you're walking around the monastery in the first part of the game, specifically... This is the song that plays when you're doing your social links and teaching your lectures and all that. And I don't know, it's just a very carefree, nice song. I always I always really liked it. I think the melody is very uh very catchy and it's it's a very present song in Three Houses. Yeah, I saw that you put this one down and I'm like, "Oh, of, of course." Right? Cuz it's <laughs> like a it's a change of pace. It's not like the epic scale. Three Houses has so many like big epic songs that I'm thinking like, "Oh, what do I pick between?" And then you're like, "Well, how about this one that you hear so often in the school?" Like, "Well, yeah. Yeah, of course. So I'm really glad this got included. So thank you for doing that. It's yeah, it's a good piece for like the total opposite. No battles. Life's good. Enjoy your school time. Go to class." <laughs> <laughs> um and then following that, my other track of the cutting room floor is Wailing. This one was composed by Hiroki Morishita. It is the final cutscene of the Silver Snow route, and despite that being the only route that I have played, I don't remember what that is. <laughs> Oops. But uh, I just, I was drawn to this song for obvious reasons. If you've listened to the past 149 episodes of this show, you already know why I picked this song. Piano. It's a beautiful, beautiful piano piece. I, I love it. It's gorgeous, and again, a great choice to show the breadth of what is available here in Fire Emblem Three Houses. I have a couple more epic-sounding tracks, though, just to kind of flesh things out. And the first of these is As Fierce As Fire. Like Wailing, this is composed by Hiroki Morishita, and this is the preparation theme in the second part of the game, where you're trying to decide who you're taking out into battle. It's kind of the menu music before you actually launch the mission, so to speak. And wow, it has an epic sound to it. I mean, I'm trying to think of previous... You know, preparation themes like in Awakening, and it wasn't anything like this. So there are some uh, big stakes here, regardless of which path you took. Because of that, it feels like it could really be a map theme, a battle theme. It just has this this great foreboding intensity to it. And I imagine that with that context of where it plays in the game, and I'd imagine how often it plays, this is a pretty important one to include, at least on the cutting room floor. This is my second or third favorite song in the entire game, and I'm alone on that, and that's fine. I don't even remember the preparation music for the first part of the game at all, but I remember this because it's it's this instant change in tone compared to everything else, because, you know, the second half of Fire Emblem Three Houses is 
way less carefree and way more high stakes than the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, really does a great job of illustrating sort of those those raised stakes and how the world ain't so carefree anymore. And it kind of sucks to live in at the moment. Absolutely. And so then the other one I chose for the cutting room floor, this is Chasing Daybreak. Kind of keeping on that same, uh, the world is not so carefree and it sucks to live in. Uh, this is the map theme for chapters 13 through 16. It's like 13 through 15 for most of the routes and then like a couple of the routes have it in their chapter 16 as well. So kind of through the meat of the second half of the game here. And so an important map theme here. This one is composed by Ray Kondo. And I think it's really interesting how you can tell that it's a different composer compared to Kanazaki and Morishita. But you can kind of feel Kondo's experience with him composing for Fire Emblem with Awakening and all. It still keeps the Fire Emblem feel, but it has a different sense of the music. It feels like a different composer. At least it does to me. And uh, I feel like this is a good one to include not only for the different mix-up of the composer, but its place in the game and its epic stakes here. I think I agree that you could sort of hear like a different stylization to it, but yeah, it it absolutely still keeps the same relative feel of all the other songs in the game. I don't have a lot of memories of this chapter. Huh. Turns out when I've played a game three years ago, I don't remember it anymore. <laughs> Oops. But yeah, this is this is a very, very good piece. I think it, it fits here uh, on the cutting room floor uh, very well. So what will I never forget about Fire Emblem Three Houses? Well, I, I have lots to learn, obviously. I have yet to play it. And it makes me wonder which route I should play. I feel like, uh, like you, I'm kind of drawn to maybe picking Edelgarden, the Black Eagles. But I have also heard good things. Like, if you're going to pick one route, uh, do Dimitri and Blue Lions. And it's like, okay, well, there's this tempting there. Especially with the uh, the local... NFL team near me with the Detroit Lions, who I guess, <laughs> as of time of recording, just got their first win of the 2021 NFL season. No more winless uh, season more than halfway through for them. So, hey, maybe that's a sign that I got to pick Blue Lions when I get to play Fire Emblem Three Houses. Yeah, I have also heard that Blue Lions is just like slam dunk the best route in Fire Emblem Three Houses. And if I play again, I'll probably do that, though I do want to see Crimson Flower. I like Edelgard a lot. Uh, I like some of the characters in the Black Eagles. Uh, usually, this would be where I, I ask, hey, hey, snap judgment. Who's who's the best girl? But you haven't played the game, so... <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've seen different ones out there, uh, but I have zero interaction with them and can't really make a call. So I'll say Edelgard, even though uh, there are, I guess, weird <laughs> things about her character in the story later about morals oops um but if we're just going on snap judgments without any knowledge of that yeah I'll, I'll, i guess i'll go her well unfortunately that's the wrong answer because the correct answer is marianne but don't worry you'll learn eventually uh, one day <laughs> i like marianne and i like dorothea a lot and i like petra a lot a lot she's so fun the only thing that stopped me from marrying petra was that i was playing as female byleth and only a few of the characters can do same-sex stuff. Dorothea is where I ended up going because she is, as far as I could tell, gay as hell, <laughs> but has a very interesting relationship with uh, men in her life, uh, which I will uh, let you learn for yourself. I think it's a very, she's a very, very interesting character. But anyways, Marianne is great. And I love her design, and I love her, and she looks exhausted all the time. Hmm. I've also heard good things about Hoppy, but she's on the DLC route, so mm. maybe not many people got to give her a shot. I don't know. 
It's either that or Hilda is also very oh, popular. Oh, yeah. yeah I would have heard things about Hilda as well. So anyway, <laughs> that's a conversation for another time when I have more experience with the game. So to transition to our next game, let's highlight a fan cover, a fan remix, whether it's from YouTube, OC Remix, wherever. I, I know. I'm sorry. I had to go back to the Family Jewel as well. Had to for this one because he did a cover, a metal cover, of course, as Family Jewels does on YouTube, a cover of God Shattering Star. And who would he get for the voice, that operatic voice that comes through? Would you have guessed Joe Zieha, who's the voice actor for Claude? Could you guess that he sings amazingly? Uh, He does. It's fantastic. I hope you enjoy. Please listen, and we'll be right back. Peter, I have a question for you. Yeah. Have you heard of the critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV with an expanded free trial which you can play through the entirety of A Realm Reborn and the award-winning Heavensward expansion up to level 60 for free with no restrictions on playtime? Where's the skip ad button? (laughs) I can't believe I made it through. That was one take. I need the people to know. (laughs) It's possible it was multiple takes edited out. No, that was one take and I'm shocked i made it through there can we get ad reads like can we get sponsorships (laughs) so we can like do that all right cool thanks i would love that hey square call me so let's talk about final fantasy 14 specifically heavensward now we talked about the original a realm reborn last year on episode 72 where had a very very troubled start and an incredible turnaround as a Brief synopsis for anybody that didn't listen to that episode. Final Fantasy XIV is the second MMO in the Final Fantasy series, the first one being Final Fantasy XI. MMO basically means it's a big RPG where multiple players are sharing the same world. And uh, it was terrible. It was really, really, really bad. So bad that Square had to put out a public apology for how bad it was. And then they brought in a new director, who we'll talk a bit more about later, who goes by the name of Yoshi P, and he somehow managed to turn that ship around harder than any video game has ever been able to. The closest rival it probably has is No Man's Sky. Basically, they ended the world in-game and in-universe, and then came out with A Realm Reborn, and from there on, it sort of rose into its current position as one of the biggest MMORPGs of all time. Uh, The original A Realm Reborn was originally released on PC in 2013. You can now play it on PS4 and PC, and PS5 is coming, I believe. I don't know if it's out yet. I'm pretty sure it's not. Now, Heavensward specifically is the first expansion to Final Fantasy XIV, originally released on June 23rd, 2015. It was, of course, developed and published by Square Enix. Like I said... An MMORPG is just an RPG where multiple players are sharing the same world. They can party up, they can fight bosses, complete dungeons together, have multiple play styles and classes that can be leveled up, and just generally working through this RPG with multiple people at a time. So, I need to give a shout out to our friend Luca, who is the on-site correspondent, as I've been calling them, (laughs) for Final Fantasy XIV, because they play it. I don't. I don't have time. You don't play it probably for close the same reason I do. Uh, But uh, Luca was uh, willing to help me out. I asked them for a story summary because, oh my god, it turns out that an MMO story has so many moving parts and it's impossible to write it all down by yourself. So I asked them to help me. Here is what they sent me. Off the heels of A Realm Reborn, the Warrior of Light finds themselves deep in the middle of a political scandal that pits the city-state of Ulda against them for a crime they did not commit. Forced to flee with only two of their scion companions, Alphano and Tataru, 
the Warrior of Light heads for the only city that would receive them in their time of need, the frozen and giant city-state of Ishgard. Ishgard itself is not free from hard times either. Upon the Warrior of Light's arrival to Ishgard, they learned very quickly that the Ishgardians are still under constant threat of the looming dragons of Maricidia, who have been at war with each other for thousands of years now. This conflict is known as the Dragon Song War. It is up to the Warrior of Light to clear their names of the crime they did not commit, reconnect with the other Scion companions, find out the truth behind the Dragon Song War, and gain the trust of the Ishgardian people and its strict theocracy led by the line of its current leader, Archbishop Thornton VII and his Heaven's Ward. <laughs> ah. So, here's where I will ask Peter, what are your, our experiences with Final Fantasy XIV? I'm willing to bet it hasn't changed on either side since last year. You're right about that, and it's interesting to see more posts on social media, you know, kind of flare up uh, because Endwalker is now out, and it's the the end of that uh, series. And also, um, I could not tell you the difference between all the expansions. Uh, I am <laughs> pretty clueless as to what uh, Heaven's Word brings, as opposed to any of the others. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And I, I'm in the same boat. I've played about halfway, or not even halfway, like maybe a fourth of the way through A Realm Reborn, and that was three years ago. They have since apparently, like, reworked that entire section of the game to make it, like, half as long as it used to be, because you need to play it to get to Heavensward. You can't just go straight to the Heavensward stuff. You need to play, you need to play all of A Realm Reborn to access it. So... Final Fantasy XIV is one of those games where it's like, if I had infinite free time to get into any game of my choice, like really get in there, I think Final Fantasy XIV would probably be up there. Because not only did I enjoy the little I played of it, uh, not only is it this super critically acclaimed MMO, but also a lot of people say it's like the best story Final Fantasy has had in years. Like, genuinely, apparently, one of the best stories in the entire franchise. And I want to experience it, but man, I don't have, like, 300 hours to dump into a MMORPG. I have other things to do. I also don't really think I have the money right now to pay a subscription fee, and that is another thing mm -hmm. holding me back, honestly. So, you know, maybe one day, but that day is not on the horizon, at least. So, last time we talked about how FF14 had a real rocky start, obviously. Released in 2010, so bad, blah 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 blah. It was transferred to director Naoki Yoshida, who is known to fans as Yoshi P, because he had experience with a Dragon Quest MMO that had been very popular. So, planning for this expansion apparently began like over a year before it had even been announced, and it had some wildly huge stakes attached to its development. Not really, like, officially, but apparently Yoshi P specifically considered Heaven's Word to be a, quote, sink or swim moment for the game. Uh, if it was successful, that would mean that uh, the train could keep trucking on, and if it wasn't, well, it might be time to take all Ishtola behind the shed, and uh, send them to a farm upstate. They had a lot of weight on their shoulders. Like, this game had already come out just absolutely messed up to a huge degree that, like, actually damaged the Final Fantasy brand. And so, it was very important that they get this right, essentially. The two themes in consideration for when they were trying to plan out the content for this expansion were sea and sky and eventually as you might have guessed by the name the team decided on sky because somehow it came with the sub themes dragon and knights which dragons i understand dragons can fly 
Maybe knights can fly in Final Fantasy XIV. I don't know. <laughs> I assume probably not, but who knows? Ishgard, though, is apparently a place that had been referenced and teased in the original release of Final Fantasy XIV, though, which I find super neat. And they felt that that setting in general would translate especially well to a more gothic fantasy aesthetic, you know, with the dragons and the knights. That theme worked very well with this area. But that's not the only thing that came forward from the original release, as the dragons in the game speak their own language. And this language had been created by localization director Michael Christopher Koji Fox, who we'll actually bring up again later in this episode, and he had actually come up with this language during development of the original Final Fantasy XIV. And it was brought forward in Heavensward since you're dealing with dragons a bunch. There was apparently some hubbub about, like, people not being super happy that they had to play through all of A Realm Reborn before they could access the new Heavensward content. As far as I'm aware, from what I can tell, this was not the case for any of the expansions after, specifically because people weren't super happy with it being the case on this one. But the team kind of felt like it was necessary so that players, like, had proper context for events leading into it. Like, this is still a story-based RPG, and as Yoshi P described it, he was quoted as saying it was, quote, the second season to a television program. You don't watch it from the second season, you watch it from the first season so you know what's going on. And I understand that sentiment. And overall, I think it probably makes the story a lot stronger. But I can also see why people wouldn't want to sit through what is, I believe, considered the weakest part of Final Fantasy XIV, just to get to Heaven's Word, which I've been told is, quote, where it gets good hmm. by multiple people. They did make changes, though, even back then, uh, to make sure that people could get through A Realm Reborn faster. Not enough, apparently, considering, again, like last year, they. <laughs> reworked it again to make it even shorter, but they did stuff like uh, they increased EXP gain, tinkered with some of the gear rewards and how that worked in terms of like completing story quests and such. And uh, I think people appreciated that at least, but again, considering they had to do it again recently, obviously was not enough. In terms of story, though, they kind of wanted to step away from the original release and Realm Reborn's reliance on, like, tropes and references to the history of the Final Fantasy series. Like, there was just a lot of, like, weaving in lore and stuff that was kind of referencing past games in the series. And they, they kind of didn't want to do that for Heaven's Word. Instead, they kind of wanted to take the story into a bit of a darker path. So they wrote a plot inspired by the history of real-world religious conflicts, which, if you've picked up a history book at any point in your life, there's a lot of those to pick from. And they wanted a general focus to be paying attention to who wrote that history book, which I think is just so interesting. It's the idea of, like, well, yeah, the winners write the history book, regardless of the things they use to win. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I was watching an H. Bomber guy video last night, rewatching it, his video on Fallout New Vegas, where he talks about, like, one of the factions is very Roman Empire cosplaying. And he, he talks about, like, the Romans wrote about themselves as if they were these grand heroes bringing freedom and peace to the world. And if you ask literally anybody else, they were like, yeah, no, the Romans suck. And it's basically that. Who wrote that history book? Who's teaching you and what perspectives are they sort of leaving out? And I think that's a really interesting take on a story like this. New classes were added being Dark Knight, Astrologian, and Machinist. A new race was also added to the game called the Al Ra. As Luca described them, they describe them as lizard, dragon, anime waifus, and edgelords. <laughs> hmm. So, do with that information what you will. Aside from new classes and quests, Heavensward also added two new types of content. This is just 
from Wikipedia. I don't know anything about these past what Wikipedia says. Exploratory missions were meant to invoke the feeling of classic MMOs giving players a target to hunt with spawn conditions that needed to be completed beforehand. This mode was apparently not all that well received in general. People didn't really like it. Deep Dungeon, the other one, was a roguelike dungeon crawling mode complete with randomly generated areas and was specifically, apparently inspired, by the Chocobo Mystery Dungeon series. And as far as I can tell, people did like that one. The expansion in general was released through six patches between the original release of June 2015 and the last patch in January of 2017. And as I mentioned before, even critics were keeping a very close eye to this expansion because it was kind of being used as a barometer for where FF14 was going from here. It would either continue the upward swing that A Realm Reborn had already started, or it would just throw the game back in the trash from whence it had come. But, luckily, it was good. Uh, It was reviewed very well. It's got an 86 on Metacritic. Uh, Weirdly enough, initial research said that people really didn't like that they had to play all of A Realm Reborn. A lot of critics actually seemed like they were pretty understanding about that, and even supportive of it. But some critics did feel it was unfair to lock the new job classes behind completion of A Realm Reborn as well, uh, which I can absolutely see being a problem. Basically, you can't play as those other three unless you're in the Heavensward areas. I don't know if that applies to the race as well. I don't think it does, but that's a little bit crummy. It sold 47,000 units in Japan across both PS3 and PS4 in its launch week, which made it the third best-selling video game in general that week in the country. It received Best MMO from the website RPG Fan, Game Informer, and Massively Overpowered, received Best Expansion from Hardcore Gamer, and nominated for Best Evolving Game at the BAFTAs in both 2016 and 2017. The next expansion, Stormblood, would launch in 2017, Shadowbringers in 2019, and last week, at time of episode's release, the next expansion, Endwalker, has gone live. People are going nuts over it, though most of the tweets I've seen have been people saying, uh, there are 12,000 people in line in front of me, and I don't think I'm playing Endwalker tonight. (laughs) Yeah, it hit like records that it hasn't seen since the beginning of the MMO, which was wild. Great for them. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy for that group, especially like I learned recently that Yoshi P is super anti-crunch because he had to crunch the team to hell to get a Realm Reborn done. And that sort of led him to realize like, oh, no, this sucks. <laughs> We're never doing this again. Well, and he felt devastated to delay the game a couple of weeks, too, like because he didn't want to put his team through the effort of hitting it. Like, much rather just delay it a couple of weeks, but felt really bad about it. So he's a good dude, and it's going to be interesting to see how he transitions his work over to Final Fantasy 16. God, I hope Final Fantasy 16 doesn't suck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, This is the expansion, Endwalker in particular. It's meant to wrap up the current storyline, though... Whenever somebody asks the obvious question of, but like, is this the last expansion of Final Fantasy XIV? Nobody actually seems to know the answer, as far as I can tell. Just that this is the end of the current storyline, so we'll have to find out. All right, let's talk about the musician that I want to cover today. We've actually heard her voice on this show before. Hmm. Her name is Susan Calloway. She is a singer, songwriter, pianist, and rhythm guitarist originating out of Detroit, Michigan. Let's go. There you go. Same state, same hat. Uh, (laughs) uh, All of this information, by the way, comes from her website, which is like the best case study. You want to see somebody with the most confidence in themselves ever? Go read the about page of Susan Calloway's website. This lady knows how to sell herself. So she began studying classical piano at age five, and at age 12, she was already studying classical voice. She had been cast in the lead role of Annie 
at age nine. But unfortunately, around the time she was supposed to begin uh, playing that part, her mother ended up in a bad car accident, and so she was unable to go on stage with that. But that did not stop her, because she began to write and perform her own original songs in various venues, and eventually ended up attending college with a full scholarship to study music. And after college, she helped found the band Red C, that's C the letter, not S-E-A, touring and performing as their lead vocalist, and eventually she did leave the band to focus on her solo career. And during that time, she became acquainted with the producer Gerard Smerick, who helped establish her solo work a lot, uh, helped her release her first solo EP in Chasin the Sun, the title track of which wound up climbing to number 37 on the national R&R charts. Her voice and music has been featured in multiple TV shows, including Dawson's Creek, Summerland, and One Tree Hill. And you might be asking yourself, how did somebody like this end up associated with Final Fantasy? Well, at some point, her work had gained the attention of none other than Nobuo Oematsu, who felt her voice would fit very well in the main theme of the game he was currently writing for, being Final Fantasy XIV. And that song was Answers, which we talked about when we talked about A Realm Reborn. From there, she not only went on to sing the main themes of both Heavensward and Stormblood, but she also has served as the main vocalist in the Distant Worlds Final Fantasy World Tour series of concerts where she has performed songs from throughout the franchise, including Eyes on Me from Final Fantasy VIII, Melodies of Life from Final Fantasy IX, and Suteki Dane from Final Fantasy X. Her most recent single, Say Goodbye, released in May of this year, so she is still, she's still cranking them out. You can actually follow her on Twitter, at Susan Calloway, that's S-U-S-A-N-C-A-L-L, O W A Y. Checking out her account there, it actually seems like she's also hosting a podcast called Scar Stories. Yeah, I did see something about that. And I believe she had somebody that I recognized as a guest recently, but I don't remember who it was. Hmm. Well, it looks like it's about. Like her and her guests discuss relationships, emotional health, personal growth, family, faith, and how to rock your life no matter what you are facing. So if that sounds like something of interest, go check it out. Scar Stories. Yeah. In terms of discography, uh, she has several singles and EPs. You can find most of them on Spotify, I believe. Though in terms of video games, it just appears to be Final Fantasy XIV and then her work on the Distant Worlds tour series. So... Square seems to have locked her down as their vocalist for now. <laughs> and a hell of a get. So, in terms of historical development research on Final Fantasy XIV, Heaven's Word, a majority of the soundtrack was composed by the man, the myth, the legend, Masayoshi Soken, who is who we covered back when we talked about A Realm Reborn. Amazing, amazing man, still doing all the music for Final Fantasy XIV to this day. When he was, like, fighting off cancer, like, damn. Yeah, really recently, too. Whew. But there are also just a couple of tracks on the soundtrack by Nobuo Uematsu, which was actually his first return to the Final Fantasy franchise in five years. So, Soken wanted to focus on making sure the music was an integral part of the experience, and he wanted to reflect the darker themes of Heavensward's plot through the soundtrack. He said, quote, Each locale's theme features the instruments that might be played there. Piano was used heavily throughout the soundtrack to add character to the other instruments. Sogan's favorite track from the expansion is the song Revenge Twofold, though sadly that did not end up on the Critical 5. Look, oh my god, this was such a hard Critical 5 to put together. <laughs> There's like eight hours worth of music, and it's all incredible. Just for heaven's word. So I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sokan-san. If you're listening to this, you're not. But if you were, I'm sorry. This soundtrack also features multiple songs with English lyrics, and a good chunk of those lyrics were 
written by Michael Christopher Kochi Fox, who we mentioned earlier is the guy who also came up with the dragon language. Overall, the soundtrack features vocal performances by Susan Calloway, Omega Bone, Michael Christopher Koji Fox, Masayoshi Soken, Dan Inoue, and Ayumi Murata. And a lot of the songs that ended up on this Critical 5 are vocal songs, so let's jump directly into it with Critical Track number one. I mean, we've got to start with the titular track, Heaven's Word. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is the main theme of Heaven's Word, right? No, it's not, apparently. It's not considered to be the main theme of the expansion. Hmm. But this is the opening cutscene music, I believe, uh, from what I was told. I think the beginning of this song is a little bit weird because it's got very processed vocals. Yeah, it's outside of the clip. It sounds really crunchy and it's like passed through a radio filter. It's It's... An odd initial listen. But then once you get past that, though, oh, oh, it's so good. Uh, This opera performance, which, hey, there you go. There's some opera vocals right there. There's the theme. Uh, It just gives you this impression that it's leading you into this big epic adventure. And then just also, oh, the orchestra is doing a hell of a good job. This is fantastic. It's a fantastic song. When I asked Luca, to uh, elaborate where it plays, which I did for every single track, so I'll have one for all of these. They said, quote, used in Heaven's Words intro cinematic and appears many, many times as a leitmotif throughout Heaven's Word and even beyond when Heaven's Word related characters make appearances in later expansions. Dragons feature heavily in this expansion. During the end of the track, we hear the English lyrics break into what is known as dragon speak, which simply is just the language the dragons speak. Apparently, that dragon speak at the end of the song translates to Our slumber disturbed, all my brothers wake, the saviors must perish, vengeance will be ours. So that's super cool, and I never would have picked up on that had I not been told about it. Yeah, I like the changeover in the clip where it goes from the opera to the the low deep chanting uh, with the orchestra swell. It's it's just a good kind of dichotomy there of what's available here in this piece. And uh, yeah, I can see how it is more of like an opening cinematic leitmotif, but not necessarily like a main theme. Yeah. Following that is a song that is on here half because Luca would kill me if it wasn't because it's apparently their favorite song in the expansion. It is Night in the Broom. So according to Luca, this is, quote, the night theme for the lower class areas of Ishgard. The area this theme plays in is completely torn apart as the result of the Dragon Song War. Homes have been ruined, families have been displaced, and there's beggars in the street shivering to death in Ishgard's frozen landscape. Ishgard's higher class guards will not do a damn thing for them. Though there is a spark of hope in this track, I often find this to represent you as the warrior of light coming to save them. I adore this piece. That's why I said it's only half because it's Luca's favorite song. It's just so pretty and it's got this melancholy to it, which then you hear like, oh, this is a place where people are like on the street freezing to death because their government's basically just decided, nah, screw them. Let them die. Who cares? Uh, I think suddenly that comes into sharp focus 
about how like how sort of melancholic this whole thing is and it feels sparse but i do agree there is a bit of a spark of hope in there but i mean it's it's hard not to feel like there's not a lot of energy behind that hope because it sounds like the people that live here have gone through a ton for sure and i do like how the piano sounds in the clip here but it's a long piece and even diving further into the piece you get some acoustic guitar, you get some organ in there, you get a little bit of harp. And I feel like that's kind of like more and more hope being infused. Cause yeah, it does sound pretty hopeless and, you know, desolate with the piano there at the beginning. But as you get more and more into it, uh, more hope enters. Mm hmm. All right. Let's talk about my favorite song on the Heavensward soundtrack and also. Uh, one that is a massive change of pace. This is Fiend. Vocals for this song are by Dan Inoue. Quote from Luca, Plays during the second phase of the encounter with the boss Sephirot. Yes, Sephirot, not Mr. Veni Veni Venios. Though, amusingly so, the name of the achievement for beating Sephirot on the hardest difficulty is, quite literally, Veni Veni Venios. Side note, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sephirot is part of the Warring Triad, and is an optional boss separated from the Heavensward main story and appears after completion of it along with his triad compatriots. Though with a song like this, is it really optional? No. If I play Final Fantasy XIV, I'm fighting this boss. This song is so good. 100% my favorite song on the entire two soundtrack releases for Heavensward specifically. Uh, it might actually even beat out Under the Weight for me, which is saying something because I love Under the Weight from the original Realm Reborn. Oh, it's so, so good. And I'm glad that in the clip, that is my favorite part of the lyrics. So kudos to you because I didn't point it out. <laughs> hey, I thought you might appreciate that for sure. <laughs> this song is great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Though it makes me think of another song, and that would be When Worlds Collide by Power Man 5000. Yeah, so apparently there was actually a controversy about that, where there were some plagiarism accusations going around. Uh, apparently nothing actually ever came of it. It's fine. I believe Soken said, like, yeah, I don't know who that is. I'm Japanese, and I don't know all of your artists. Uh, so yeah, it was very interesting to, to learn about that as well. I'm not saying to push for it, but I hear it and just like, oh, this is what <laughs> it's like when worlds collide. Are uh, you ready to go? Cause I'm ready to <laughs> like, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, baby, baby. <laughs> but none of them are singing about how the sun is setting and darkness is taking over. A date with chaos and you're dressed to the nines. Those are real lyrics, by the way. Those are the actual lyrics. It's great. This song is really fun to sing along to. Following that, we have critical track number four. This is Rise. The vocals in this song were apparently done by Michael Christopher Koji Fox himself, who also, you know, wrote the lyrics. Quote from Luca, 
This song actually has lyrics and isn't just mumbling. Plays during the final phase in the optional boss fight against the primal Alexander. Alexander is the name of the boss itself and the name given to the raid series itself. Alexander is the final boss in this series. Half those words, I don't 100% know what they mean, but yeah. Uh, this song is rad. It almost sounds like something out of Devil May Cry in a lot of ways, uh, just with the vocals. The boss, if you look up a video of this boss, he's like this big building-sized metal robot being. Sort of city-like, because in the past when you summoned Alexandria, you're summoning the city of Alexandria. And, uh, hey, this is a really, really fun song to listen to, even if I'll never understand what any of those vocals are saying. <laughs> even when told what they're saying. But, uh, it also gets really weird. Later in the song, they, like, go into auto-tuning the vocals, and that's a bit of a choice. But overall, like, I, I super dig this song. I really like its sort of industrial feel and all that. It's really fun. I definitely hear the uh, Devil May Cry sort of comparisons as well. I also hear it and I think of it could fit really well in No More Heroes. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, it definitely has a, a video game music vibe that we've heard before. But yeah, while well, the, uh, <laughs> the lyrics that don't sound like their lyrics is certainly a choice. And, uh, you know, it's, it's got a, a vibe to it. Yeah, I, I dig this song a lot. Not as much as Fiend. I like Fiend better than any other song I'm going to talk about from here. But it's pretty good. And for critical track number five, we have the actual, apparently, main theme of Heaven's Word, Dragon Song. This song is actually one of the few tracks that Nobuo Uematsu came in to compose. So, you know, it had to show up here somewhere. It's also considered the main theme of the expansion. But also, the vocals you hear are Susan Calloway. There we go. So we got her in there, baby. This is, like I said, said the main theme of the expansion. I get mixed answers when I ask if it's this or, you know... The song called Heaven's Word for the game called Heaven's Word? Nobody didn't seem to give me an answer about how that works. I think this piece is absolutely gorgeous, though. And I think I like answers just a little bit more. But damn, Miss Calloway can sing. Yeah, she's got some pipes, and it's uh, good to put this one on here to highlight her work. And if it's up there for contention for a main theme, which... By the epic scale and Uematsu's composition, that might suggest that it's, yeah, it's a pretty important one for this soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Now let's get into tracks on the cutting room floor. I got two. The first one is interesting. <laughs> Speaking of vocals, it's Unbending Steel. Vocals in this song were once again done by Dan Inoue. Quote from Luca, this plays during the final phase, during the encounter with the primal Ravana, during the Heavensward main story quest. Ravana himself is this jacked, massive, bug-like being that has multiple arms and glowing swords in each of them. The most memorable thing about this fight is his directional parry mechanic, where you can only hit him from a certain angle for a brief period of time. If you hit him from a side he's parrying from, you will most likely die due to your attacks being reflected back to you. Ah. The vocals alone are what brought this song to the forefront of my mind when I was planning out this list, because those are some 
damn deep vocals. Is it my favorite song that I've heard with vocals on this soundtrack? Oh, God, no. But, like, you don't hear this deep in video games unless it's, like, the main theme of God of War, where it's not in English. And I just found that interesting. Absolutely. And you know how with God Shattering Star from Fire Emblem Three Houses, like, the tenor operatic voice Mm -hmm. drew its attention to you. So does this, but even lower. It's a bass vocal. And uh, yeah, just impressive. You're absolutely right. I, that's a good comparison to think of the the Norse Kratos theme from 2018's God of War. But yeah, that's, that's a group. And this is just solo bass. Uh, amazing. Yeah, I cannot imagine being able to sing that low. Following that is a song that actually was originally going to be on the Critical Five. But then I learned about Dragon Song, and I had to put that in the in the Critical Five because it's where it belongs. But this song is Equilibrium. The vocals on this song are by Ayumi Arata. According to Luca, quote, plays during the second phase of the encounter with Sophia, one of the other warring triad members. Another optional boss fight, Sophia is all about restoring and keeping balance. The encounter with Sophia involves the field you're fighting on swaying back and forth, trying to knock you off. While you're dealing with positioning yourself, you still have to fight Sophia, who will deploy mind-controlled mummies as enemies that will try to hypnotize you into falling off the platform. Pretty hectic encounter the first time around, if you ask me. Uh, if and when we cover Stormblood in the future, I hope Arata was involved with that game soundtrack, because I think I want to know more about her. She's got a hell of a voice. But also, this song's near as hell. <laughs> Just in English. Uh, it sounds like something I would have heard in, in one of the near games. This song is absolutely fantastic. Like I said, it was almost on the Critical Five. Uh, The other song on the cutting room floor used to be a full reorchestration of the boss battle music from Final Fantasy VI, which is on the soundtrack of Heavensward, which is rad, but... Amazing. This song is fantastic, though, like, just in general. I couldn't not... I couldn't leave it off. I don't think anything else has to be said, where you're absolutely right that it sounds like it could just as well fit in a near game. Miss Arata has a fantastic voice. I want to know more about her. So, what will I never forget about Final Fantasy XIV? I mean, the soundtrack's all I really know. Again, if I had, like, unlimited free time and didn't have to worry about any responsibilities, I would probably just blast through all of Final Fantasy XIV. But as that is unrealistic, because I am a millennial and retirement is a fairy tale, I'll never get that. Yay! <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just I love the soundtracks to these games. Oh my god, the Final Fantasy XIV soundtrack is one of the main reasons why I think Masayoshi Soken might be up there as one of my favorite composers currently working in the industry. Yeah, he's incredible, and I think it's telling that. You know, when we're trying to put together the last bits of Best of 2021 and try to finalize our lists, Endwalker is one of those games that requires due consideration. Now, will we be able to hear enough tracks and will there be enough music readily available? Uh, We'll have to see, but I think it tells you plenty that you gotta give Soken's work some due. But with that said... That wraps up our conversations about fantasy warfare games with operatic soundtracks, or at least tracks in them. Uh, It's good to finally cover Fire Emblem Three Houses and then get to the next installment of Final Fantasy XIV with Heaven's Word. That will do it for us this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at String Pixel. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want, hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. 
That's where Joe's other podcast, Smasher Pieces, is hosted. And you can find original Sound Chat and Smasher Pieces wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all around the globe, even on Spotify, where we not only have a podcast feed with those episodes, but a Spotify playlist, where if we talk about a video game track and it's on Spotify, it gets added to this monster playlist. Uh, Fire Emblem, a first-party Nintendo game, so I'm guessing it's not there, but is Heaven's Word on there, Joe? It sure is. Uh, it's split between two albums on Spotify, being Heaven's Word and The Far Edge of Fate, but it's all on there, and so that'll show up on the playlist uh, shortly. Excellent. Good to hear. When you're done listening to the show, you can find the show on social media at Soundchat OST. Leave some feedback for us. How are we doing with these episodes? Give us some suggestions for games to cover in 2022. And also let us know if there's anything that we should make sure we're checking out for best of 2021. We're a couple weeks away from locking that all down. All right, Joe, who are we talking about next week? I will be talking about Stafford Baller. And I will be talking about Sarah Schachner. Ah, another one I have looked forward to bringing to the show for a long time. Cannot wait. All right, Joe, let's play us out. Hey, did you know 8-bit chiptune remixes of songs are cool? They're great. I did. <laughs> and uh, that's why when I was sent this 8-bit remix of Fiend by Luca, there was nothing else I could use. It had to be this. It's super, super fun. It is by the YouTube channel Obro Akanea Music, that's O-B-O-R-O-A-K-A-N-E-Y-A Music, and it's just really good. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>